Just Deep was able to, uh, to transform uh, its organization over the course uh, of a number of years um, as it, uh, it sort of uh, tackles and uh, challenges that front of it. And so today I'm going to come in and uh, talk a little bit about how we, we did that. Um, as uh, Mark mentioned, I'm a technology fellow at Just Deep, although I've run many engineering teams over my time there. Technology fellow at Just Deep basically means I get to help a lot of teams now uh, work on how to they, they can incrementally improve and get sort of the next generation, and as the organization grows out, uh, make sure that we continue to scale on sort of the excellence, both development-wise and operationally. So, um, let's see if this works. So, uh, the title of my talk is going to be how Just Eat leveraged AWS to create a uh, DevOps culture. Actually, create is probably not the right word. Foster is probably the, a better word. Um, but really, what the talk is about is how we uh, took on some challenges that we were seeing, how we went to uh, the cloud, in this case, Amazon Web Services, and how that was able to, uh, to really be instrumental, but how we were able to change our organization, uh, have scale both the technical systems and uh, the organization itself. Um, and actually, to do it without using the words DevOps, even though I used it twice in this title slide, a um, better uh, title probably is, uh, if it comes up. Uh, so how we were able to sort of address some of the challenges that we were encountering in, uh, in sort of the late 2000s, um, and then how we were able to achieve our goals, and then transform our culture. So a little bit about Just Eat. Uh, just a quick show of hands, how many people have heard of Just Eat? How many people have used uh, Just Eat? All right, fantastic. It's a bit more than the last night of this talk. Uh, so Just Eat, um, our present here in Vancouver, uh, we are an online presence for local takeaway restaurants. We make it very easy for uh, consumers to order uh, food via multiple channels, website, uh, native apps, uh, and have food delivered to their door. And we partner with the thousands of takeaway restaurants um, that, uh, that actually go and do what they're good at, which is cooking the food. Um, so, we are, uh, these are a couple of the views on uh, recently. And you can see here, this is my order history, or at least recent orders here in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, if anyone knows a good Indian restaurant, I'm actually quite interested in finding a good Indian takeaway. I've got sushi covered, but uh, also, great, also for tips afterwards. <laughs> uh, we're present here in Vancouver. You may have seen some of the marketing that, uh, that we've been doing in Canada recently. It's certainly uh, an a area that we're looking to grow uh, significantly. Here's some of the bus marketing that we've got. Uh, here, I think going down Broadway, last my saw it. Uh, but we're also present, of course, across Canada. And uh, I'm not sure people are aware, but also around 15 other countries worldwide. So Just Eat got started in 2001 in Denmark, actually. So uh, one of the small ones right up there um, is where the company got started. Um, in 2001, it's sort of early days of e-com, and it was one of the uh, many companies that thought this was a great business idea. It's probably the only one that actually survived from that time period. And there was definitely some tough days in 2002, 2005 um, for the company. But then it uh, managed to get itself uh, sort of straightened out and sort of expanded into Europe. Um, at one point, 2007 or so, expanded into the UK. And uh, the UK market uh, quickly became the largest market by far um, for, for Just Eat and still is today. Um, and you can see now in 2015, we're in about 59,000 restaurants. I'm sure that number's a little bit higher than that right now, but that's probably the last published number. Uh, and 11 million active customers. And over the course of uh, recent history, the uh, order growth, the number of orders through um, the e-commerce uh, platform in, in the various countries has grown pretty significantly. Now, that particular problem is a great problem to have. It's good to have uh, growth, but it comes with uh, a lot of pain points as well. And certainly the organization, the technology stack that was built in 2001, was not ready for any kind of scaling efforts that we started to see as we uh, hit the UK. Um, and what uh, I came in to do and help with is to figure out how to bring agility to those um, structures, those technical systems, to the organization itself, how to then get much better, much faster, uh, and uh, how to actually scale both the technical stack in the face of ever uh, growing number of people and the organization to actually achieve that in an effective way. So I'll talk a little bit more about these challenges. So here are the sort of peak order rates. So as you can imagine, in a uh, takeaway e-commerce company, we've got an, an interesting um, business in the sense that our busiest time of uh, the week is probably Friday night and Saturday nights. That's when we have a, a number of people that say a, a takeaway is a great idea. 
uh, and they have an expectation of sort of a 45 minute delivery window. That's when they expect food to arrive from the door. Uh, so that presents an interesting challenge from a technical bit. That fulfillment cycle is, uh, is a key one. And this shows some of the, the order rates, um, that peak order rate that, um, that we were seeing uh, through from around 2008 to 2012. And I'll stop there just for now. Uh, some of these things, um, I joined just deep right about here as they felt the pain of scaling from this particular bit here and that particular bit there and realized that actually um, from a company point of view it was going to continue and if all signs in the UK at that point were that it was going to be very successful that actually uh, lots of change had to happen. Uh, also in, uh, we would have periods of time as you can see, let me just skip ahead a little bit, interesting challenges. These are basically the September to December time frame each year where in the UK, it gets a little bit cold. Um, you know, people have stopped uh, doing summer barbecues, and they say actually, a, a not going to the house in the uh, wet winter is a great idea. Let's order something in, and that became a ever increasing problem. So these particular um, accelerated curves brought lots of challenges to us. Certainly, in the ones I was painfully involved with. In, here, here, and there probably, maybe a little bit over there. These were things where we were just getting through. We were trying to work with our existing system and throw hardware at it, uh, do anything we could to get better for the next coming Friday or Saturday, but a lot of pain involved in that. And in an organizational way, uh, lots of challenges. There was a, a technical operations team that was sort of tasked with keeping things up and running, and then there was a development team that was trying to actually ensure that uh, the systems were you know, being more flexible, that change was easier to bring into the, uh, the technical systems, and that um, the actual you know, um, evolution of the product continued. When I joined in 2009, there was no mobile app, there was no native app. Um, the actual uh, front-end site hadn't changed very much. In fact, when I joined, they hadn't been able to do a successful deployment for about three months um, because of the challenges of the actual uh, development cycle itself and, and making sure that it was functionally complete. And then the non-functional size that would also, if it wasn't something functional that went wrong, it was a non-functional issue that would bring things uh, to a grinding halt. Uh, so the business understood that it could not continue in that fashion uh, and tasked a, a number of us to figure out how we're going to actually make this a, uh, a more viable uh, system and a viable business. This is what it felt like uh, probably around 2010, 2007. That's when we stayed in Vista, if anyone's interested. Um, and this was basically what Saturday nights and Friday nights felt for a lot of us in 2009, 2010, as you know, uh, hungry consumers would hit the site from about 5.30 onwards, um, and we would have you know, uh, very interesting scaling issues from a, from a certainly from an operational point of view. Um, and of course, there's also the, the uh, challenges with scaling the organization as well. So, you know, the company decided that it was going to, it you know, got some funding um, to go in, and grow this business. That made it very easy to bring new people in. I was one of them. Um, but of course, you just can't throw people at problems and hope that things are going to be better. So making those people effective um, and actually structuring the organization to realize what you'd want from the technical systems was a big challenge as well through 2010, 2011. And then just the scale of change. So with the more people you have, the more that they want to be able to get change into the production environment that also becomes a bottleneck, becomes a pain. Um, if it, you know, the worst kind of uh, change is the stuff you can't actually make live and can't actually see its value um, is sitting off on a source code server somewhere. So this was kind of the scenario for us that we felt, um, and we realized that our sort of our operational environment, which is part of the data center in Copenhagen, um, which you know, probably was there from 2001 to 2002, just wasn't really up to the task that we were going to have to think about something else. Um, in order to be able to actually be able to only scale for you know, the next year coming after that, but the, the hockey stick growth curve that we could see in front of the business if we were actually able to stay in business. <laughs> this, is, this is actually, I've been pretty sure this is the end of a football game. It, it might be in a loop. Um, <laughs> Stadium and this is happening, right? And you see those images at the front, they're actually people on horseback. Right, this is, this is the, uh, the bonkers, but these are, these, are, these, are, these are all just people on horses, and that's just crowd leaving Wembley. Um, it's pretty, and they're all headed to the tube, by the way. Um, that's where it all breaks down. That's the, the 
Men det där ska vara bra. Vad har du? Vad har du? Så där har jag belöjt det. Jag har gjort det presenterat. Jag har inte gett opportunitet. Så vad har du? To stop the tube from being overloaded. They've trained those horses, they'll all turn sideways. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly all the people stop. You know, because no one wants to run into one of those horses, they don't smell great. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's how they regulate the, the tube traffic. Yeah. How, how very modern. <laughs> <laughs> Works better than gates. <laughs> so, um, so we had, some, we had some strong challenges in front of us as a business. We knew this as a technical organization. We knew this from um, our you know, constant need to, uh, to be capacity testing for the next weekend. You know, so we would go through a Friday or Saturday night, and if we were uh, successful, that's great. But then on Monday morning, we'd be doing capacity testing for the coming Friday or Saturday. We need to have more headroom. We knew that we wanted to get this in sort of a, an incremental fashion. We need to think about big step changes around that. And there were some other things that we needed to do, but there's a couple things that, um, well, you know, this list here um, really wasn't actually any of uh, the goals that we had in our position. There was no one within Just Eat that said we want to go to the cloud. There was no one in Just Eat that said we need more of these agile frameworks or methodologies, or actually what we really need to do is DevOps, which I don't think actually was a real term at that point in 2010, 2011. Um, none of that was uh, anything at all that just the itself as a business was interested in. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but for me now, maybe I should change this one. Uh, put Agile instead of DevOps. <laughs> but you know, the words start to lose a little bit of meaning. Now, you know, that's perhaps a, a, the wrong way to phrase it in this particular room, but, uh, but certainly uh, just cargo culting, methodologies and frameworks does not lend itself to, uh, to the results that are probably the right size for the company at the right time. And so, for my point of view, which is why the title slide was about how to do this without using the word DevOps, it was never a shortcut for us to just come up with a term or, or refer to a, uh, a, a term that would hit the, uh, you know, the buzz. Um, it was more, much more principle-based, and we'll go through a little bit of some of the principles that Just Eat uh, adopted and fostered, and then what that led to. So for Just Eat, it was much more around these things. Uh, we wanted to be faster. We want, absolutely wanted to get more change out quicker. Um, we wanted to be able to understand uh, what that change meant to from the customer perspective and then feed that back in. And we were stuck with systems that we couldn't uh, keep up long enough to actually reel that in. We wanted to be more resilient because we didn't want these things to fail. We wanted them to, to be stable, scale, and secure. And then we also wanted to make sure that we could put most of our engineering thought into the customers and restaurants, the actual business problem. The uh, product itself it sort of stagnated from around 2005 to 2010 as they were playing whack-a-mole, keeping things up and alive. So we wanted to make sure that the bulk of people that we hired weren't spending their time thinking about how to keep things up and running, but actually focused on the user experience, the customer journey, our partner restaurants, and the things that we weren't doing um, at all, but lots of people could see that we should be doing it to give them actually some focus time on that. So to do that, Thank you, Clint. We'll get you on that. We started thinking about, uh, first of all, putting in some measurements. So starting a baseline from where we were. And from an engineering point of view, we focused on these two things. Because we realized if we got these things to be much better, we'd be in a lot better shape than we were. They're not the end all and be all, but there's some other things that we measure. But these things uh, were good indicators to us as an engineering organization that we were on the right track. So keeping the system up from a customer perspective through sort of the peak time of ordering from 4 p.m. till about midnight was a metric that we started to measure. If the system wasn't available or um, for customers to place orders and have food delivered, then we uh, basically score ourselves very low. And now on the rate of release, we want to ensure that we were getting change through the pipeline. What change it was, even if it wasn't even all that critical, we would focus on that later, but actually making sure that we were getting regular releases uh, out into our production environment. Now, these two things can be slightly contradictory. Often change brings instability. And so uh, we had to make sure that, which is why we have both of them. I think any one of them could be gamed, and you could easily um, keep the system up to a certain degree by putting no change through it. Of course, there's always change in terms of customer usage, which is one that was struggling us, and data entropy. But you know, we could definitely uh, focus on that. But then we wouldn't have a product evolving the way that we need to do to actually be really successful in the later years. So both things were required, 
Um, and that's a good way to, uh, to put in measurement is to have a counterbalance that you're also measuring at the same time. So for those goals to actually be a possibility, we realized that we needed to rethink how um, we were actually going to be able to, to do this. Um, and what were the things that we were wrong within the organization, within our technical stack? What were the things that we needed to make sure um, we really considered and uh, were able to put right? So one of the big problems that we had as an organization in, um, I guess, around 2010, 2011, is that um, the responsibilities um, were different from where the authority lied. So there were lots of people had authority, but actually weren't responsible for things. Um, and so there are lots of also cases where uh, people were responsible for things on a Friday night, but had no authority over it. So I was one of those people. I was uh, on the hook for things in an operational perspective on Saturday night. I ran a, a team called Platform Operations at the time. Um, but we didn't actually control the change in any shape or form. We had no authority over the change at that particular point in time. So, you know, whatever people get through in the production environment, I sort of lived with on a Saturday night. Now, it wasn't quite as negative as that, um, but it did highlight ultimately that, that change or that, um, that difference between responsibility and authority. Because that was one thing that we as an organization started to think about really carefully. We wanted to make sure that as we altered and as we changed and we evolved, that we aligned uh, responsibility and authority. We want to make sure that they were connected. And um, in that case, we believe that good decisions would happen. If you're going to feel the pain of your actions, then uh, I think that you're going to be more thoughtful about that pain, especially uh, the next week. And that incrementally improving that will lead to much, much better things. And we also want to do it in a way that didn't have gates. So we didn't want to have that command and control. If I owned it Saturday night, I didn't want to be the person that um, we say no. Um, that's a great way to not encourage change. We want to make sure that, um, that as much as possible, that we would continue to have change on the platform, that there wouldn't be any blockage to teams getting their particular change through into the production environment. Um, and so we want to foster a culture where actually uh, teams were able to go off and make the change they needed to make. But connect that to the authority and the responsibility that comes with it. We also wanted to design for failure. We definitely knew that it was possible, and we wanted to think about what would happen when things actually failed. Um, we wanted to make sure that we degraded gracefully, at least as gracefully as possible, when things uh, went really wrong. Um, because they will go wrong. Production environments break, things happen, bad change gets in. We want to have a system that is resilient to that kind of change. Um, and we wanted to make sure that those key hours between 4 p.m. and uh, at midnight, and again, the bulk of it being on Friday and Saturday, we can't really afford to have a bad one of those. In the end, it affects the business in a really uh, large degree. Um, so we want to get much, much better at that. So building failure into the, into the organization. In fact, more critically, making uh, failure almost encouraged as a, an option, just not on Friday and Saturday nights. Let's try our best to avoid those. But um, to, to change the organization's way of thinking about failure um, took a long time. You know, one of the things that we uh, talked about was how blame is boring. And build that into a mindset uh, in your organization it takes a while to do. But once you do, you've got a, a great chance for people to, one, take some responsibility, take a reasonable risk, determine if that risk was well-founded or not, and improve. Um, but if they are fearful because of blame um, or failure, then they will not do those things. They will be risk averse. You will not see the change going through your organization. People will fail to take the chances that you would want them to. And so culturally, we have to make sure that uh, people understand that failure happens. It will happen again. It, uh, it probably happened uh, sometime in the last two weeks in some way. Let's not have it be catastrophic. Let's not have it end up meaning that things fall over entirely. So those were all the things that we wanted to do as an organization. We knew that, um, that we had these things as, if you like, principles um, within Just Eat's uh, technical culture, but how to actually make it a reality. Uh, it's great to have these principles, but if you can't execute on them, and you can't improve them, then they all they become are things on a wall that everyone points at and says, who's the company that came up with these? And they, it doesn't have the belief uh, within the organization, and people leave because they are, feel uh, that their expectations have not been met. Um, so one of the things that we realized uh, pretty early on around 2011 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, that our data center um, that we were in um, in Copenhagen was not the way to actually uh, scale out the, the technical systems and we wasn't going to be able to take on the kind of change that we needed to do. Um, and so we started looking at alternatives and that's when we started looking um, significantly at um, how the organization is structured um, and then also the, the technical pieces. Um, so I don't know how many people, anyone familiar with Conway's Law? Has that come up in any other session today? Um, so Conway's Law, and I won't repeat it, you can read it here, um, is an important one. Um, and it kind of just describes what how organizations work and what the technical systems that they produce are going to look like, or more likely look like. Now the great thing about Conway's Law, um, you, know, you can choose to believe it or not, but, but we kind of believe it, is that you can then say, well, if that's the case, then what we need to do is create an organization that results in the technical stacks that we want. And so uh, we decide to change ourselves, um, and it's now a thing, as uh, ThoughtWorks Technology Radar coined it, or at least found enough customers that were doing it, uh, called the inverse Conway maneuver, which is basically put your organizational structure in place to get the technical systems that you want. And so for us, a big part of uh, what we were able to accomplish was to think about what do we want our systems to look like and reorganize along that way. We want small independent teams who could ship change themselves, they could own all of that. Um, we wanted to have that uh, responsibility and authority connected. So it's not enough to write some code, you know, uh, ch check something in Friday 3 p.m. and then say, good luck guys, hope the weekend goes really well. Um, that's unlikely to lead to uh, the right positive outcomes. So we want those teams to be on the hook for it. And we want them to absolutely be responsible for the code they write on Saturday night when it is actually being used for the whole purpose of why they're there. And then finally, we wanted to, uh, and I mentioned to go faster, uh, but go faster with resilience in mind, uh, foster rapid, confident change. So we needed to put some uh, team in place that made it easy for all of the other engineering teams to get change into the production environment in an effective way. So, the short version of that, you build it, you run it. And that's what we ended up doing. Um, it was pretty impossible to do this in our uh, data center in Copenhagen. We had a, uh, a number of machines that were effectively probably built you know, four years previously had been reworked, uh, you know, change in the negative sense had accumulated cruff, had accumulated in this infrastructure. Uh, you needed a map or lost experience to know how to walk around it. Um, it was, you know, snowflake service is the term. They were very special and had to be treated with care. And so we didn't want to give people the ability to go and uh, effectively touch and share that. And so there are a couple of things that we looked at um, one was, you know, we could virtualize that our infrastructure within that data center, but actually the lead times for, for growth in infrastructure and getting our managed hosting provider at the time to get new hardware in was somewhere around six weeks. Um, and actually, as we could see the hockey stick going, that wasn't going to cut it. And so around 2011 or so, we started experimenting with, uh, with the cloud and with Amazon Web Services, and we looked at ways in which we could uh, think about migrating to it. And that became a... Uh, a goal in 2012, I guess, yeah, pretty much through that, that particular um, year. Uh, how many people are familiar with Amazon Web Services? Just a reasonable show of hands. Anyone using it in Anchor today? In production? <laughs> yes, for real? All right. Um, so we figured out that, um, that Amazon um, allowed us to achieve sort of our, our goals. Uh, there was going to be a big learning curve, and there was a large migration to it. Uh, happy to bore people with the bar later on with that, some of that story. I'll talk a little bit about some of the technical migration, but more about what it allowed us to do. Because what it allowed us to do um, was to give some of this uh, authority and responsibility to the teams. And we knew that AWS, um, from a scaling point of view, uh, was not going to have any problem. There was no, ch no challenge to getting new infrastructure into that environment. Uh, this is a quote from uh, James Hamilton, who's a distinguished engineer. Uh, at Amazon, um, and this came out of uh, Amazon's Web Services conference last year, uh, kind of struck me. Um, but yeah, Amazon adds, and this was in 2014, so it's probably more than that now, it's probably when Amazon, the company was, uh, you know, um, in maybe 2008, knows. But enough infrastructure to run the previous Amazon.com, I mean, it's a $7 billion business in 2004, every day. And when you think about that, that is an incredible amount of infrastructure. So we knew that scaling, that piece of scaling, wasn't going to be the problem. 
the, that challenge wasn't really ours. And in fact, that's the, how we thought about it. We, you know, I and my team at that point were, were in charge of trying to keep this infrastructure running instead of actually focusing on the business problem that Justine had. Um, so all of that uh, uh, infrastructure management was a commodity business at this point. Or certainly the cloud was pointing at it that it was going to become a commodity. And there's little differentiation to be had there. Um, and so why do it? Let others do some of that heavy lifting. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Amazon was so appealing. The other, of course, or if not of course, but certainly became clear to us. Gosh, I should check the colors before I can this one. It looks very orange on my screen. Um, <laughs> but, um, but just showing the sort of rate of um, feature releases within AWS over the course of time. When we got started here, you know, it looked you know, reasonable, but nothing magical. Uh, certainly over the time, we've realized how much benefit we gain by not having to do something and let Amazon get to it first. And so I have a recurring conversation with Amazon about our roadmap and theirs. To say, should we build this particular service because we need it, or are you going to be building it by the time we're done? Is it going to be already live? And that um, becomes a great thing to chat about. Well, we don't have to do this, you're going to be doing it for us. And all we have to do is consume it as a service, and we can focus on the business of actually ensuring that consumers love their ordering experience and enjoy their food and actually really want to come back uh, to their restaurants and, and of course, to us. So, um, I talked about um, a little bit about resilience. Um, within uh, the Amazon environment, um, our CTO at the time, of course, in 2012, was a little concerned. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with, with Amazon Web Services, but they certainly had some interesting growth problems themselves in 2011, 2012. Uh, you know, I, we didn't uh, suggest to our CTO that uh, US East 1, where all the problems seemed to happen, was where we wanted to be. But at that point, we didn't have a great um, you know, sense of knowledge as to what was the future likely to, uh, to hold in terms of the failure modes that we should expect. But we did know that instance failure is going to happen all the time. So instance failure, the, the Amazon's um, EC2 uh, compute service has uh, virtualized machines and they just will fail. Um, not regularly, and much less than we thought. We expected more of it, but it will absolutely happen. Often it's because the underlying hardware, is something wrong with it, you're being scheduled for maintenance, and it will just go. You can get some notification, you can try and handle that if you'd like. We wanted to design our systems so that that instance failure could just happen and we didn't need to care about it. Because if we were worried about one uh, virtual machine falling over, then how resilient possibly, can we possibly be? So design it to, to, be, uh, to be gone. The, the, the phrase is uh, treat those servers like cattle, not pets. Um, we didn't want to keep them around. Uh, we want them to go. So how do we build that in? How do we have the confidence, of course, that our design uh, and our intent is actually um, connected to reality. And so, well, I'll talk a little bit about how we prove this. We also want to be resilient to AZ failure. Does anyone know what AZ is? Availability zones? Is that the term? It's effectively it's a virtual data center. So uh, in um, EU West 1, which is the Amazon region that uh, Justine runs the majority of its business, uh, there are three availability zones that we have our, our infrastructure in. So that's three data centers, and from Amazon's point of view, those are you know, separate floodplains, different earthquake pieces, you know, all sorts of different power supplies. And actually, if you go back to um, James Hamilton's talk, uh, and I really recommend anyone interested in Amazon Web Services, go and have a look at that talk. It's spot 301 if you want a, uh, from 2014, reInvent. You can find it on YouTube, but if you want the link, come find me afterwards. He talks about um, what a availability zone is, and in most cases, the availability zone is actually made up of more than one physical data center. Um, but the availability zone concept uh, is, is one that um, we wanted to be sure that we could handle its failure, because we'd seen it before. And certainly in 2011, 2012, Amazon would lose availability zones. And so, not in any big you know, recurring way, but it could happen. Um, and so we wanted to be ready for actually, if we lost a data center, how would we keep the service up? And then how would we, do we prove that that intent is actually connected to reality? So we started by reading the postmortems. I don't know if you've, uh, anyone's ever looked at some of the Amazon postmortems, but they're excellent bits of technical writing because they describe how things failed. And not only you know, how they failed, why they failed, and the most important bit, the things that they're going to do to prevent that from happening again. Um, and in fact, there's probably some more recent ones that if anyone here familiar that uh, there was a large DynamoDB 
uh, based outage in US East 1 about uh, maybe a month ago, something of that nature. But that plus more is, again, a fantastic bit of writing. It tells you more about how Amazon works internally, because you realize everything actually is being used. Uh, uses DynamoDB, or lots of services do. So they uh, sort of eat their own dog food in a reasonably uh, new service. But reading these talks to, talks to you about how you should architect your systems, how you should build uh, in for failure. And customers who built things well did not suffer anywhere near the failures that others did. And of course, we've read some of those customer experiences after these events as well, and looked at how they designed their system, talking with Amazon solution architects about how do we get ready for AZ failure. So a lot of this uh, baked into our thinking about how do we make sure that not only are we prepared for failure, but that we've got it baked into the, the actual technical systems, and that when things happen, it doesn't take uh, you know, hours or days to respond, but minutes or even less in some cases. No human response necessary, but the systems do the work. Now, one thing we didn't, oh, I'm sorry about the uh, graphics, but hopefully that one came across. We didn't spend, focus a lot on region failure. We decided for, certainly when we get started, that that was going to be an unlikely event. We didn't have a good region failure postponement to work on. Uh, and we decided it was going to be a, you know, an event that we shouldn't have to plan for much. I just did this kind of Sharknado and made a gift in, really. Um, but it wasn't something that we were going to focus on. That said, since that, we've absolutely uh, read post mortems and looked at when uh, certain services had have, have had region failures and how do we deal with that. I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a while. That's <laughs> a new talk. Um, right, so some of the key technologies that we used to, uh, to achieve this. Um, and again, I won't make this uh, an Amazon, too much of an Amazon talk, but hopefully it's of interest to some of you. Um, and if it's really interesting, please come to that me afterwards. You know, we looked at auto scaling as a key technology. Auto scaling allows uh, you to define uh, how much of a, a uh, fleet of instances that you want, and if an instance goes, how you whether you want it replaced. It allows you to scale things in response to load. Um, we didn't get these things for free. We actually had to put a lot of work into redesigning our technical system to meet the cloud. Um, so a lot of things used to rely on uh, file systems or uh, state being kept within the server, when your machines die, there, you cannot hang on to any state there. So we had to think about how do we get rid of state from the individual machines. Um, that was a big change we put in. How to not could keep anything on a local file system. So Amazon's S3 service became the default place for anything that needed to be kept in any length of time uh, from a file point of view. And then looked at using you know, relational databases, Amazon's DynamoDB, and other persistence mechanisms in order to get uh, state outside of any individual machine, because again, they can go at any moment. Elastic load balancing allowed us to just simply uh, manage the traffic between these instances and uh, uh, works well with horizontal scaling. As instances are going up and down, uh, the elastic load balancing allows us to balance that load and knows when a machine is uh, up and when the actual application uh, is available to service. You can define health checks within elastic load balancing that allows you to uh, determine whether something is actually ready to, to actually take traffic. And virtually, finally, uh, virtual, not finally, but uh, sort of the, the virtual private cloud, um, which allows us to basically hide most of our infrastructure, 95% of it, in private subnets, and then expose a small element out to the outside world. We wanted to have as secure as possible an environment. Um, and this was a reasonably new technology in 2012 when we adopted it, that allowed us to only have some of our uh, load balancers effectively in front of uh, actually accessible to the public, not the underlying instances themselves. And then finally, a critical technology um, for us in order to um, ensure that our teams, our engineering teams, uh, could go as fast as they needed to go and be responsible and have the authority over the change they needed to go was to uh, adopt CloudFormation. CloudFormation is a technology um, that allows you to uh, effectively, uh, declaratively describe your infrastructure and then have that become a physical reality. And so we split up our platform into numerous CloudFormation stacks. Um, the, it's just a JSON document that describes Amazon infrastructure um, and things like auto scaling groups, elastic load balancers, um, the DynamoDBs. Um, it makes it very easy uh, for teams to write it's just JSON so you can uh, validate it, um, you can 
uh, inspected, it's very easy for, well, not very easy, relatively easy to read. Um, it is a little bit verbose. Um, but it's also source control. So our infrastructure suddenly from going from being off in the data center and you know, be careful to touch was recreatable uh, <coughs> via source control. And that allowed us to create production environments in both dev and QA and any other uh, environment that we'd like. They became immediate uh, replicas of our production environment. And then finally, we realized somewhere along that journey that it was also important to keep dry or to not repeat ourselves. Um, and I'll, I'll tell a little bit more in just a second. Because in the end, right now, we've got, I think, 165 is the last time I looked at that. Um, different stacks owned by, I guess, 10 different teams. So even the teams themselves, they've realized the value of putting change through um, in small incremental ways and now try and create you know, um, small services that do one thing well. Um, again, I'm trying to voice buzzwords, but that's the, the journey that we're on now is to take uh, what was a big ball of mud in terms of a web application, um, the .NET one, by the way, I didn't mention that, but we're at a .NET shop, and turn it into multiple independent pieces of infrastructure that can be deployed and changed at their own rate. And that becomes a continued um, evolution for us. Now, I mentioned the um, important to keep dry. When we first started the migration to Amazon, um, the migration team I was part of that. We picked out one of our countries. I mentioned the 15. We picked the smallest one that we could find and said, right, this is going to be our pilot. It's going to be the one in the cloud first. And so we chose Norway. Um, Finally, Norway is uh, a very small country in the uh, Just Eat uh, family. I think it was second or third that um, the, uh, the Danes went to um, on sort of their, their Viking tour of 2004 or five as they expanded. But it's, uh, it's a market that isn't very large. We you know, joke in the UK a little bit about how much of a UK Saturday night the Norway business is. I think last time we looked, it's about 15 seconds of a UK Saturday night is the entirety of Norway's night. Um, so I don't mention this story when we're in with the Norway country manager or any business. Um, you know, it's still a profitable business. It, the scales is very different. And if Norway was our problem, we would never have gone probably to Amazon. We would never have these, these issues. Uh, but what we realized when we, so we took Norway and we said, we're going to put this into Amazon first. We're going to use CloudFormation as the a big mechanism to get there and start splitting up uh, the, the application. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of challenges along the way. We've had to tackle some of the work that we mentioned around S3, getting things off of file systems and designing in for the failure. Lots of change that, um, that we either spiked in terms of, yes, this can work, and now the team has to pick it up and make it a real thing for the rest of the countries. Uh, but we pushed Norway to, uh, to Amazon uh, in, uh, I guess, 2013, I think it probably end of 2012, beginning of 2013. And we realized that, oh, we're going to have lots of cloud formation, lots of repeated snippets of code uh, that we then handed off to teams to go off and, and be productive in and to, to make their own change as we need to migrate all the other countries. And so what we realized is we have a quickly devolving set of infrastructure that was going to be a nightmare, especially for a team that has to own a chunk of it that describes some common bits. Uh, we had to go to that point, I think, 70 files to make a change. So we quickly realized this is not going to scale. We need to think of a different way to achieve uh, our independence goals at the same time and making it possible to make common change across the entirety of the infrastructure. And so, again, I mentioned that CloudFormation is just JSON. What we realized is that we could template that up and that we made it very easy for CloudFormation to be the thing that we talked to Amazon with. But for the other engineering teams, we focused on actually just giving them a, um, a small bit of, uh, of a template document to work with. What's the common infrastructure that you're going to need? What are the uh, uh, options and parameters to pass into that template system to generate your cloud formation. How are you different than anything else? Are you a you know, a web service of some kind? Are you a worker process? These were the, the flavors for the most part. And if you needed to, you could go off and get uh, some custom resource. And we made it very easy for teams to do that. But that allowed us to absolutely drop these 60 or 70 different files that were quickly going in their own direction and end up with a common core and uh, allow teams to just generate that piece. And that was the uh, work initially of uh, this team that got created um, and to make the, the uh, scale uh, effort that 
all the other engineering teams need to do, much easier to do without duplication, and also to make our job easier. So this is the team that ran for a while. Um, that was our first challenge. How do we make teams go fast and keep ourselves uh, from going crazy at the same time? These were the other, so that was sort of around the deployment environment services. I mentioned the virtual private cloud VPC. We ended up creating um, the same VPC that we're running in production in every engineering team's development account. So they had the exact replica of what the environment looked like from a network shell point of view, from a subnet's point of view. So the same private and public uh, pieces were there, the same network firewalls were in play. All of that became the source code that you could run through. Uh, the thing that was really different is when they ran their instances, we didn't scale them out to what would look like in the UK on a Saturday night. When we ended up being much more cost effective and we'd run much smaller instances because the load requirements weren't there. Uh, we still had to tackle that load capacity testing, but we didn't do that in those environments. We also built, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, other pieces in, in that network. Um, we had to make it easy for uh, features to get out to the internet, so if they need to call a third party, often this is the payment service for us, so that was a service that was not most of us at all, so those, uh, app, those apps need to go be able to talk, so we just provided some of that underlying plumbing. More importantly, those other teams didn't need to care about it, they just trusted it would work, it was a service effectively, to them it was all just cloud, some of the service built by us, some of it was by Amazon, the other teams didn't need to care, they just needed to think about the payment flow and how to make that as seamless as possible for the customer while making sure that the risk for just eat was as low as possible. And there's a couple of things. Again, if you're interested in the Amazon space, we can talk about why we ran security groups from that level, mostly for change and the kind of uh, who's responsible for that change. Most of our decisions here was who's responsible for this when it goes well or when it goes bad, and then to uh, put that change in that team's uh, authority. <coughs> Probably no one can see this, so apologies for that. But what it really was describing here is, is sort of the, the very large JSON document that makes up CloudFormation. And if everyone's only seen one, it is quite large. It can be significant. We turn it into a, a very simple, this is for one of our, our uh, engineering team's features. Uh, do you need an ELB? Do you use our login client? Very simple yes, no's to a uh, set of options that would then, when run through a um, a generator would produce the cloud formation that we want to look like. And again, all of this was just a little bit of code to generate some JSON that would then be fed into Amazon's uh, service, their, their API. And so this last point, the other thing we can see this, it just, you know, the instance type. So this is our production uh, configuration uh, that said it was an M3 medium, which is a class of uh, compute resource within Amazon. Uh, in the uh, development environments, that would probably be a, I guess, an, an M1 small or even a micro. Um, uh, at the time. So again, it allowed teams to have a configuration that was specific to production and then one where a, the smallest change possible to the non-production environment. We wanted those environments to be as close as possible because otherwise we couldn't really trust what those things were going to do when they hit production. Removing those changes was a large part of how we could continue to get faster and continue to incrementally improve rather than just sort of hope for the best when things land into production. We also built a service, um, we called it Just Deploy, but it was there to get packages, basically, source code packages into that production environment, again, in a rapid, confident way. So instead of each team figuring out how are they going to do deployment, build a service for them, so that, again, to let them focus on the higher order Just Eat problems that they need to work on, and provide some visibility. Because, of course, the more, those 165 stacks I mentioned, they're changing all the time. It's very difficult to keep track of what is changing. Um, so. What we need to do is build up just enough visibility to give both the teams themselves and a little bit of others uh, what's going on in the environment. And Just Deploy tries to do exactly that. When's the last change gone through? Was it successful? Um, and across all of the different things that we would run in a production environment. We also built the teams a monitoring service because, of course, they need to know if they're going to own it. Is it working well or not? Um, and if not, why not? Um, and so this became, again, a cultural uh, center point. You know, enough times asking the teams, how can you tell someone, show me the graph. Um, and you know, for a little while our mantra was, you're not done until there's a graph on the wall showing that this is working well in production. And of course, 
working well in your QA environment. And we built a service to make it very easy for teams with no um, need to synchronously talk with an ops team to get new metrics into the environment. So if you wanted to know how much of a particular event happened um, or how well something was working in a quality of service metric, you could absolutely build that, measure it, and deploy it in the production environment without having to talk to anyone else. The service here would take just a UDP packet effectively and turn that into a graph um, and then be able to show you how well your stuff is working. Now there's some underlying metrics around resource, CPU, memory, disk that we made uh, ubiquitous and available to all. You didn't have to go and think, oh, I need to go get my CPU metric. That was just baked into the actual instance itself. All of that telemetry, the underlying stuff, just popped out into graphs. But then there were higher order business level and service level metrics that you as a team needed to focus on and to answer the question, how well did you do on Saturday? Now if there was a problem on a Saturday night, what are the metrics that are missing that you need to work on on Monday so that we know next time how to identify that problem much faster than we did the last time? And repeat, rinse, do again, all of that over time leads to, I forget how many we've got now, we have a metric somewhere, on the order of 2.1 million metrics, I think, flowing into the, this environment sort of on a 10 second basis. So um, we built this ourselves uh, because the Amazon service at the time, which is called CloudWatch, did not meet our requirements. Uh, so it can take custom metrics as well, um, and those are the ones that we were most interested in, the things that described how just the, the systems were working. The CloudWatch has a one minute granularity and has a retention for two weeks. We wanted much faster insight and much longer chance to review. So we keep uh, 10 seconds of granularity for about 13 months uh, over the two million metrics that, that we kind of collect on every 10 second basis. Um, and that gives uh, the ability to for teams to go in and look at how are things running right now? Um, and then, uh, of course, what are the things that we need to uh, measure on next as new code change, features come into it? Uh, we also built an alerting service. And actually, I say built. We uh, found some open source software that um, fit our requirements really well. Um, it's a tool called Siren. I don't think anyone's heard of that. But it allows you to set up um, alerting based on uh, the uh, graphite uh, infrastructure that I had in the previous uh, slide. So this allows teams to uh, define, uh, and these are just te these are effectively tests running in production all the time. Is the best way to think about these things. These tell you whether or not your code is operating. You can choose to be blind. You can choose to have no tests and hope for the best, or you can incrementally improve the set of tests that you've got running in production all of the time, so that when something goes askew or uh, unexpected, someone knows about it. And if someone knows about it is the person who probably wrote that code in that particular week. That is the benefit of teams um, operating what they build, is that they're closer to the change than anyone else. There's no other team you know, looking for an old run book, trying to dust it off and hope for the best, or wondering where the metric is. Uh, the team that wrote it knows it better than anyone else. And we make sure that they are the first port of call um, for that particular uh, event. That uh, team, um, those alerts are also just defined through, this is some YAML uh, with a command line tool. Again, no ops team involved in terms of, you know, I want a new alert. The, the development teams, the engineering team, I should say, are completely self-service. They are tasked with getting better at this. If there's a, why didn't anyone know about this when it fell over? That's the first discussion on Monday, where we're going to improve around our alerting so that someone can know about this thing that now looks like a significant issue. And then finally, um, we also used a software service uh, external writer, PagerDuty. Does anyone know PagerDuty? Yeah, I was going to have one of their lovely ringtones and just wake people up, and I took it out because it gives me bad, bad flashbacks. Um, but uh, we use this. It's a fantastic service that's reasonably affordable, which is one of the reasons we, we still like it. And, um, that combined with a, a basically a shared chat group that focuses on operations um, gives us the right balance of team visibility and individual <coughs> programmability. So each of the engineering teams has a rota who's actually on call for that set of services they're responsible for. Uh, when an alert goes off, PagerDuty gets notified, that engineer, whoever's on call, gets notified, and uh, the rest, everyone else, knows about it from that shared chat room. Um, and that gives us that right balance of operational visibility and accountability um, to the individual teams. So we have to extend Siren a little bit to work with PagerDuty and to work with HipChat, which is our um, chat uh, technology. And that's, I think, almost positive that's uh, been contributed back. I am positive. 
one of the last services that we uh, built as well to be able to uh, foster this spirit of rapid confident change was a centralized logging service built on top of uh, Elasticsearch uh, Logstash and Kibana, which is referred to often as Elk Stack. Again, this is because it didn't exist really in a formal fashion. Certainly within Amazon at the time, there were all those been uh, large attempts, in fact, to do this itself. Elasticsearch is now available as a service within AWS, I think, in the last month. Uh, and then also some of the, the CloudWatch improvements. At the time, it didn't exist. You could purchase it um, as, as a service from the likes of Paper Trail, Logly, Log Entries, I think, was another one. But at, we looked at kind of great expense for the amount of traffic that we wanted to push through there. So we decided to run it ourselves, and that's what the platform service team owned for a bit. It allows teams to, again, one of the things on machines are log files. Get those log files off of there. Those instances can be gone at any moment. Get them into something that allows teams to use those logs as an active, real-time debugging tool. Uh, and so uh, that centralized logging piece allows the engineering teams, when alert goes off, to jump in to see what exactly is happening across the 40 instances that might be part of that service. Uh, and look for aberrations, look for patterns, look at the actual log detail. And again, just like the metrics, if there's a, an issue that isn't easily resolved, on Monday the conversation becomes, what are the log messages that would help us identify this particular bit, or it gives more detail than we actually had, so that we're not fumbling in the dark as we were on, on Saturday. Through attention. Just there. Oh. Um, so right now we're keeping about three weeks, I think, online, because no one looks logs over the three weeks, um, all, all that stuff is backed up, and so it's just stuck in death three. Um, you know, again, for us within the cloud is that we don't want to keep some stuff online, but uh, the cost of cloud storage just keeps doing that, um, and so we just push it to death three, it goes to Glacier. If we need to get a log file from last year, we can go and get it. Um, it just requires a little bit of effort, and we're putting in about 350 gig. All this is a little bit old now, I think the slide's probably, you know, probably another 25 to 50 gigs that we probably have that with it. Uh, and that's sort of the rate that all of the uh, teams as we've been scaling uh, start pushing into this. Again, what it, that's a lot of data. Um, and most of the, if you're an engineer responding to something, you don't care about 350 gigs of that, uh, probably. Um, there's just a very small piece you know, uh, that you care about. The uh, Kibana interface into Elasticsearch allows you to identify that and get that quickly. Um, if you haven't, uh, if you're interested, please come chat with me afterwards. I'm happy to show you what we've got. I realized actually that screenshot's a little too, um, so the command looks a little bit different than it does. But that service allows, gives everything to the engineers to go off and be fruitful, productive, um, and be confident about what they're going to do, and to go fast. Those services that we built on top of Amazon allow the individual engineering teams to have that accountability, to have that authority and responsibility. It's really hard to give people you know, responsibility without some of these underpinnings, because then they're just you know, they'll, one, uh, if they're clever, they'll avoid in the first place and keep the an old structure alive. Um, or they'll, they'll fumble or build something um, independent, focus on that problem rather than on the business problem that we want them to be on. So that, again, that common ground in terms of services allows a small minority of uh, the department to focus on that bit and the majority focus again on user experience, uh, the restaurant partners. And then um, the last thing that the platform services did while well, we made this transition that we migrated to AWS and we gave people the, the actual, you're really on call for this stuff, you know, here's your pager, that's a big change. Um, most, most people were very, very keen. They wanted that authority. They didn't like being told, no, you can't. So I, I told people no in 2011 because I had to do all of the risk calls for Friday and Saturday. Are we safe or not? Um, staying up was way more important than any future change coming through. Uh, we devolved that risk call to a degree, designing for failure as an expectation to those teams. But you know that that doesn't immediately become uh, perfect. So there's a little bit of, of time where we, as a platform service team, would used to do all of the ops, provided some secondary support and some you know as a call calmness under pressure. Because when you're first in a production environment, you know, and things go wrong, um, it can feel uh, a little bit like this, um, and um, you know that's really hard. Uh, to have engineers uh, be confronted with. And of course, their immediate reaction on the Monday is, I don't want to ever go through that again. So how do you incrementally get better at that too? Um, and so 
being involved in that, you know, most of the people who've been in platform services and else feel like this a little bit more when things are going wrong. And um, you know, used to things being uh, slightly problematic and knowing how to, uh, to focus on the, the problem hand, the impact of the issue, and the right mitigation. Often, you know, initially developers want to go and fix the bug you know, in situ on that Friday or Saturday night. That's not important. The response to the issue in the production environment is what we need to focus on. That mitigation is where we need to, uh, to do what can we do. And again, if we can't do anything, then that becomes a Monday discussion. Wait, we've learned about failure now in an interesting way. How are we going to improve the underlying uh, product to be more resilient to that type of uh, failure in the future? Let's go and put some operability requirements into this particular service so that it is easier to have more of a gradual degradation rather than just a complete falling over. So this is what it ended up looking like. Again, apologies um, if the text is a bit hard to read, but you know, we had a set of platform services that the uh, that team was responsible for, and then uh, what we call platform features, all of the other things that we were able to start to break up from our sort of monolithic web app into a set of uh, APIs that would be consumed by very thin clients, both on the desktop and on native apps um, through, through APIs. Um, and those teams uh, had pretty much complete freedom to go off and do what they need to do to make those things successful. And that became a, a great pattern for the engineering team and led to smaller services with more uh, constrained domain and much easier to keep in your head, much easier to debug um, when something is slightly askew, um, and the ability to change them independently. Now that comes with a little bit of thought. Um, we want to have, you know, just because I say that we wanted independence doesn't make them independent. So we had teams had to build things with backwards compatibility in mind because everything can be changing. Um, I had a quick look before I came to the talk, and I think 20 of these things have changed today in the UK. Um, that constant change becomes a, a pretty much a norm. It's always under change. And so backwards compatibility, independence, uh, is something that needs to be protected. So finally, um, after going through all of those uh, efforts, understanding how to, uh, what we wanted, how to actually do it by uh, leveraging what AWS provided us for free, effectively, and, and continue to scale and get better at. And then what we need to put on top of that to allow our engineering teams to be faster, better, and more accountable for the things that they put in, to have that recurring incremental benefit. Um, we ended up with a scenario where our people grew, which is, is a great thing. They grew in lots of ways. Um, operation, they became much more experienced. Uh, they became much more accountable, so they had to put a lot more thought into what they were doing because that, that pain was going to be felt by them or their teammate on that Friday or Saturday if they had chosen poorly. So the risk profile for the entire engineering department became well attuned to reality. Rather than just being overtly risk averse or slightly cowboyish, it became in the right place. And effectively, if you had a service that was on the major order flow as you walked through the site, you were very aware of that. There are some ancillary things that weren't on the major order flow that we would be more risk uh, interested in. So for example, restaurant ratings was not, is not on the critical path. And so we could be a bit more um, aggressive and advantageous, look to the docking technologies there to prove them out before going into some of the other services that were on the order flow. Uh, and that's what some of the teams did to pilot new things that they wanted to go faster. Uh, and to again, evolve some of the infrastructure that was still in place from 2001. You know, we still run uh, Microsoft SQL Server in AWS. Uh, it's one of those services that Platform Services runs um, because that's where a lot of our data still lives. However, many of the teams have said, right, I'm getting out of that relational database. I'm going to take the persistent service from Amazon. Thanks very much. I'm going to migrate my data there because I don't want to be dependent on that shared resource that has an interesting scaling challenge in, in and of itself. Um, so that particular uh, authority and responsibility that uh, that we wanted in the organization completely um, found itself in the actual engineering teams and in the people. And that particular connection to authority and responsibility builds trust because now everyone's on the same hook. There is no one that gets off from uh, on Friday and says good luck unless they're not on call or off on vacation. Then, yeah, absolutely, you've done your time and your team is now ready to take on that particular time. Be thoughtful, be careful, and consider it around them. Do the right thing. Um, it became a mantra for the people who are actually going to be um, the ops team um, for whatever reason on that particular Friday and Saturday. Uh, and then finally, those uh, two things sort of combined for us a little bit along with those principles into an organizational culture 
that um, I think is probably, um, for us, our main uh, weapon against attrition, change, um, in terms of people leaving, because uh, they be really believe the organization wants them to both grow um, and wants them to have responsibility. They can see that daily. Uh, their decisions carry more weight than others um, in terms of their services. And that culture um, of, uh, of ensuring that the right problems are being worked on and that the, the right challenges for that particular engineering team are going to get the, one, the right attention. If it was tough on, for you on Saturday, on Monday, everyone expects you to be focusing on that. And that said, if it wasn't tough, if you thought well ahead and you've got good capacity in there, you're ready to go, then actually go as fast as you possibly can. And um, let's get the, the actual uh, rate of change up as high as we can. I think in 2012, 2013, excuse me, uh, we probably had about 40 deployments in the, over the year as we were doing this migration and change. You know, I mentioned the 20 that we've done today. It seems to be in the thousands in 2015. Um, you know, that is a lot of change to the, the environment. Not a small change. None of these things are big, right? They're often just a small change. But you put in the services that make it easy to get that out, to understand that it's working well, and keep repeat, and you can go very, very fast. And recently, again, the goals, those things, um, we were able to achieve, um, and we had said um, most of our team is focused on the how do we want the business products to evolve. So that was another facet. We wanted to focus on the products, not the projects. Um, and so we put that mindset into play. Um, the resiliency that we leverage from both AWS um, and using it properly, not just building up our same data center snowflake instances in EC2 that were more prone to failure perhaps, but to actually architect for uh, to make sure that we were ready for when failure happens. And then the speed of change, how to get the deployment services and monitoring services, all working services in play, to know that you're going fast enough uh, in a controlled fashion, not out of control uh, and making things worse. And finally, in the view, uh, what that looked like, I think I showed you up to here. This is probably the last one. You know, what the peak order rates started looking like in the UK. Um, and this is goes up to the end of 2014. Uh, it goes a little bit harder than I think we get to about 1,000 um, per minute in the UK now on Saturday night without much trouble. Uh, when I joined, I'm not, it's kind of a cheap graph, it's only two data points. But I joined in 2009, you know, there were three months uh, where we had been able to deploy. We're now doing uh, you know, multiple uh, deployments a day you know, in, in the tens, twenties. Um, that rate of change is effectively zero. There's nothing blocking teams from pushing out a change immediately. Of course, that has a benefit when things go really wrong on Saturday night. If you have to roll forward with an emergency release, you can. Everything's there to push the small change you can. Great, and that's me done. Thank you very much. For the time. I'm happy to take any questions now. We have a few more minutes. If yeah. Yeah. Minutes for questions. Oh. Sorry. Pretty much as fast as the team wants to go. I mean, I, you know, certainly the QA environments are automated, so they just deploy as soon as it's built in, in first control. We uh, want a bit more thought put into it from the team's perspective. Um, but, you know, a, an engineering team might release the same feature three times a day, or uh, their set of things, everything might get released on the Monday. Um, we encourage uh, deployments early in the day and early in the week. Uh, they, you know, so one of the things that one of the things the deployment service does is after 3 p.m., it kind of says, are you sure? Um, because actually at that point, you know, it might be helpful. Um, it, you can absolutely override it, uh, you know, but it is a, just a, you know, that's something I probably didn't talk enough or at all about. You know, we wanted teams to go fast, but there's also obviously some operational experience and risk that we couldn't just say, well, let's hope and incremental time will get better. But some of that got built into the systems, into the services. Um, uh, but automated, not a not a conversation or my judgment trumps yours. It is built into the system that actually after 3 p.m. you might want to think about deploying this in wait till tomorrow. And same thing that on Thursday, um, 3 p.m. window actually lasts all the way till Monday. So on Friday, if you try to deploy it again, you get that real question: Are you sure? Because is this change worth the the risk it's bringing to the weekend? How much is it going to be? We want people to be thoughtful. Sometimes they just need a bit of remembering of what to be thoughtful about. You talked about resiliency of infrastructure. You you also have the resiliency in the 
software itself, like a service A, call service B, if that call fails, how is service A supposed to respond? So as you uh, build up many, many more uh, services, and there is that dependency chain, absolutely, that's a, that's a problem. Uh, so there is, there is some work going on in that space now um, for us. Uh, some of it's being done by some teams, some of it may end up in the platform services group. Uh, it's an area that we're focusing on. I think knowing the state of your dependencies is an important thing, and that's where we started at, is that, well, how do you know what you're calling is healthy? And if not, that should be a, a engagement to that team. We expect them to get that alert as well. Um, and are they maintaining quality of service or not? You know, so how many calls are failing? Uh, how long are they taking? These are the things that we want uh, exposure and visibility of, and then uh, put the right, uh, the right pieces in. But there isn't anything right now in place in production that circuit breaks around that or anything of that nature. Uh, do most developers with uh, production service are they on a rotation in uh, Everyone uh, who builds software it just eats on a rota. Yeah, you, you don't get to commit without. Now, not on day one. Um, so if you join, and you, you know, it, there is a absolutely a process uh, to learning. But that is the expectation. That's that's the hiring process actually for us. We, you know, when we do hiring, and I didn't mention that in some of the advantages of culture, but for hiring, it's a huge advantage for us, we find, because uh, one, it's a great screener. So we talked about, you know, operational responsibility, accountability, and authority, and that either, you know, that becomes sort of like a black and white issue. Either the developers say, fantastic, I, please give me more, or they say, thanks, I'm going to go somewhere else. So as a screening process, it's really effective. Um, and we want that particular, uh, reality to, to hit home with people. We don't want it to be something that becomes, you know, uh, a, oh, I'm on the Patriot this week, I hope it's quiet. You know, you want, you should know it's quiet. Um, and that we want, you know, people to be thinking about that pain constantly, because when it's not you, it's someone else from your team. Um, and if you're not thinking that fashion, it's unlikely that we're going to collectively be, be good. There are some QA departments and dedicated test servers. We just deploy everything and so we Lots of pre-production testing that goes on, um, as fast as we can make it, um, because we want to again get change out quickly. Uh, so, you know, automated test suites, uh, they, you know, they exist and those happen in, in environments of prior production. Um, those are often aimed at the, not the sort of the functional um, side of things. Um, we also have uh, in our production uh, environment and in the staging environment, non-functional uh, tests that are exercising capacity, so we know um, that on tonight that we're good for Saturday in six months' time, effectively. Um, we constantly run that extra load uh, to, uh, to keep our capacity measures. Because things don't break down linearly. They break down non-linearly when change goes in and suddenly things fall off. We want to know about that at Monday at noon rather than at Monday at night or Friday at night. So exerting uh, that uh, system uh, as it exists at that moment in time uh, is important. I think the other thing to remember with for pre-production environments, it's very difficult to get the latest version of everything if your stack is moving so fast. And so, you know, you can absolutely test in isolation. I'm not saying that it's not valuable, but it's not enough. And so, actually, the only environment that's going to really tested is production. That's another reason why we want people to go fast and to get things in line, because production's been test, you know, teaching more about your assumptions than anything else. And some of those will be great, and they'll work out well. Some of them will not. And so, you'll have to go and address that because actually your expectations have been not met. So how do you handle Sorry, it's just a question about how we'll come back. Uh, Hi. Hi. I was going to uh, ask what the uh, stacks, 165 stacks of emission. So uh, maybe a are they like equivalent to like a containers, like Docker containers, or you haven't looked at those? No, it's more of a logical definition of infrastructure that, um, that you can uh, uh, update or, or get rid of at one time. Um, and, but it can, it can contain, you know, a CloudFormation can contain just one EC2 instance, or uh, it can contain, we've got one of the ones that, uh, that I used to be responsible for, just contains security groups for everything. And that was the, that was the, the CloudFormation that allows us to change that um, independent of the others. Um, and that, I guess, is, the, is one of the other pieces. And also, care that you can get rid of it. That's now the, I mentioned earlier the model, you're not, you know, you're not done until it's a graph somewhere. The model now is, is you're not actually done in production until you've retired that thing from production and uh, replaced it with something else. Uh, happy to show you some confirmation afterwards if you like. It's probably doesn't think the screener is not going to let me show uh, any good screenshots, but I'm happy to show you what it might look like. Another question? 
what kind of mechanism is there with the card on your device? Do you have a checkpoint of the code, or do you have a snapshot and roll back to that, or already fix it? Probably not in production, but how, how do you manage that? So we make it very easy for people to go back to the previous version. Um, I hesitate to use the word rollback because, of course, everything else has moved forward. Yes. Data moved on, other teams have moved on, change has not worked. So, you know, you're rolling forward to the previous package, is how we describe it. Um, <laughs> that, that may be good, that sometimes, right, and often, often, often that's great. That often fixes the, you know, the functional bug or regression that's been introduced, um, and, and you're happier. Uh, sometimes, though, going backwards is not, and, you know, that, that's the... Um, it ends up presenting a different set of problems because, again, in reality teaches you something that you thought was true that is not. Um, again, that, you know, drawing, again, that's why I stress you're going forwards to a previous package. <laughs> time is a pretty important part of any production system. It only goes that way. We have time for like two more questions. But not for me. <laughs> Hi. Are you guys completely insulated from the logistics of delivering the food? Like, if you just provide front end restaurants or restaurants to do with it? No, although that's how we started off. So in Canada, certainly, we have um, uh, some partner services that take delivery off restaurants that don't want to have a delivery fleet, but they want to gain the benefit of a sort of just eat. Um, and that's something that we're looking at in many, many uh, um, countries. Um, it's an area of intense focus right now for us about how to make that fulfillment cycle uh, better for customers because you're only as good as the moped driver they've hired to get you your food is perhaps for our business not good enough. Um, and then also um, to understand the, you know, to, to provide better information for customers so they don't have that I'm placing order and I'm hoping food turns up. There's nothing worse than, and I'm sure people can attest to this, than having a family who's hungry as a customer service experience. That's a tricky one. Getting that wrong um, you know, puts you in people's bad books for a long time. So we want to get better at, uh, at providing information in that fulfillment cycle after you've ordered and after it's left the restaurant as to where it is, you know, how far away is it. So there's lots of active work going on that for us. Yes? How many environments are you just supposed to have here from development to production? Three or four, I'd say. It depends a little bit on the what um, and the, where the change is. So is it on the order flow or not? Um, there are a couple of environments uh, and you can, as a team, can choose a little bit to sidestep them. Again, that decision, you know, the uh, responsibility of getting the decision right comes with your authority and habit. But you can absolutely skip some of these, and you know, there's nothing stopping people pushing the production straight on, except the reality of that. And that, over time, you know, is, uh, is where people's uh, decisions are pushed. Right, I think. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any other questions later. I'll be sitting on the panel. Feel free to. Uh,